It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again. Time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 431. Tonight I'm joined by Emmo. Hello. Ashgar. Greetings. Grace. Hi. Kodra. Howdy. And Tam. Hello. So I'm going to talk about something real quick because it, I don't know, it, it, it's a thing that's that's happening in my life and uh, I don't think I've ever talked about it on the podcast, but we have had a female calico cat living in our backyard for probably almost five years now. Like I have a, it's a, it's a totally feral cat will not let me get close to her at all, but I feed her every night. And then about a month ago, two dogs got into our backyard and chased her off. And we were scared to death that something happened to her. And the neighbor says he saw it and she got away. But like, that was all we were operating on. But like for the last three days, she's been back and she looks pretty bedraggled and extremely stressed out. But she's starting to, like, get back to normal. So I only bring this up because I saw her when I was walking upstairs. And she's chilling out on the back deck. It makes me so happy that she is back. Because I was scared to death something had happened to her. Because, like, when a feral cat disappears, it's not always good reasons. But anyway, that, that, that is my, my, my story about the feral calico cat. I'm, I'm glad super your cat glad. Is back. Yeah, I love that cat. I like watching the videos that you post of her, and I am glad she is home. Yeah, like today especially, she has started to act like the backyard is home again. Because like for the first few days, she would come out only briefly when I was feeding, and today she's kind of been lounging in the backyard the entire time. Also, we went and got some dirt to plug the hole that the dogs made underneath the fence. <laughs> anyway, um, last epoch. Is this so, the thing I think it's about? <laughs> so last week, near the end of the podcast, I mentioned the last epoch was one hot fix away from me really wanting to get back into it. Uh, that thing is that they finally fixed the ability to move around abilities on a transform through a top box, which sounds like a small thing, but if that's the primary way you're playing your character and you can't put your abilities where you want to put them, it really sucks. Yeah. But that hotfix went in, and I am very eager to get back into that game right now. Uh, like, the other thing that I thought you might have been talking about is it sounds like they're backing down from the whole move and attack not on the same button as well. They are, but I don't care anymore. Actually. Yeah, I don't care about that anymore. <laughs> like, like I, have, I have gotten used to a different control style that I like better, but that was a, that was a line in the sand for a lot of people. I'd imagine it was because that's the way most of these games have controlled for a long time. Well, the funny thing is, is like when Diablo four beta came out, there was an equally huge line in the sand for the people who didn't want it to be attack and move on the same button. (sighs) Just let people choose. It's not that hard. Yeah. Please. Just let us configure things. I would really love it. If path of exile gave me a force move button that wasn't on my hotbar, so I wasn't giving up an ad, an action. I admittedly have yet to play a build where that matters. Yeah, I haven't either. Yeah, I still kind of agree. But I'm okay. Like, I, I figured out a way to play it, and life's good. Um, yeah, like, Path of Exile, conti- not Path of Exile, uh, Last Epoch just continues to generally make good decisions, I think. Yeah, and they keep just fixing things that are broken and making things that are working well work a little better. And continues to be incredibly fun. Like, while you all are over playing Path of Exile, I have skipped this league <laughs> entirely and have been happily working my way through Monoliths. That is great. I should see if this hot fix fixes my controller issues. I have no idea about anything on the controller side. It drives me, it drives me crazy when things don't have proper controller support. I mean... It's the worst part about it. I mean, I know you've experienced this. It's like 
it makes you feel like you're crazy because everyone else is like, hey, this just works for us. And I'm like, yes, yep, yep. It, I believe it does. I don't mm -hmm. know why my system doesn't work with this. And I don't have a good way of troubleshooting it. Yep. Better hope that there's some buried Reddit thread somewhere. Speaking of controller support for games, I don't know if any of you have seen this, and this is kind of a tangent, but I guess Bungie and other manufacturers are trying to crack down on people who use a keyboard and mouse as a controller. And what I mean by that, there's been a, a thing that people have done on the PC version of the client is they hook up a uh, emulator is, device basically that makes it think you're on a controller. Is this because they want to have mouse and keyboard with auto aim? They, yeah. they do. That's exactly what they want. Uh, and that, is, that has been a thing that some people have been doing to cheese the system for a while. Um, and they're starting to crack down on that. And like on one hand, I fully support cracking down on cheaters, but also I would rather play console games with a mouse and keyboard. So I, I don't want it to necessarily become an illegal thing to do. Is a turbo button cheating. Yeah, that's that's basically where we're at. But I I would love it if, you know, uh, Sony and Microsoft just patched in keyboard and mouse support for their games since I tend to not play uh, somewhere other than in my office, I would absolutely just play most of those games with mouse and keyboard. But yeah, it's been interesting, the, the rhetoric. Um, I guess on eBay, there has been a deluge of the emulator devices as people are realizing that the gig is up. Is, this is specifically for Destiny, I'm guessing? Specifically for Destiny, but I guess uh, Activision is doing it as well with Call of Duty because it was also a thing there. But like Bungie is trying to walk a line between tr de determining who is doing it for cheating purposes and determining who is doing it for accessibility reasons. Good luck with that. Good yeah. luck. Yeah. Wow. Because like if you think about the Microsoft accessibility controller, like it supports a lot of alternate control schemes. And it would be horrible if they accidentally banned people who were using that. So this topic's been on the list for a while, and I didn't really know what better to say. But, like, there's a thing that I've noticed in several games, and it's most recently come up with Last Epoch. Um, like, Last Epoch is a $35 game right now. It is really cheap. But it has shocked me the number of people that have taken offense to it having any cost at all. Like it's not free to play? That it's not, yeah, that it's not free to play or it's just not free. Oh my God, going into a tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I, I, I guess I, I've never fully understood that and maybe it's just because I've come from the realm when, you know, games always had costs, but... I'd say for the vast majority of my life, it costs money to play video games. Right, right. At all. Yeah, like, and I don't know exactly how we got to this point where having to pay any amount to play a video game is just an offense. It makes me sad because there's a large number of games where I would really rather them just ask me for some money up front instead of yes. nickel and diving me yes. once I get in. I mean, uh... May let our listeners into a harsh truth. If you are not paying for something, you're the product. <laughs> yep. If you think that you're getting the game for free, you aren't. Because either they're squeezing out way more in tiny payments than you than you're intended to ever realize, or you are you yourself are being monetized and not seeing a dime. It's one of those two things. It's probably both. Yeah, and a lot of times in games with PvP, the free players are basically there as fodder. Yeah, like you're the you're the product. You're the NPCs. I don't know. Like it's it's just it's been weird seeing that Reddick pop up on a game that is still so theoretically cheap for what you're getting. Yeah. Well, I mean, and there's a certain amount of just honesty about it costs this much to play this game buy in or don't right like i mean to to use an example that 
that is the universal punching bag of, uh, you know, the games industry, I think incorrectly. I have, I, I think that the most honest and most, uh, player friendly monetization in the industry mm-hmm. might be star citizen because yes, it costs, it can cost upwards of $200 for a single ship. You have to click, you have to go through seven disclaimers about what you are actually buying. And at any point, you can refund that ship for store credit. They have a, it's like a 30 or 60 day, no questions asked refund policy. And even after that, you can just refund it for store credit. Like, oh, patch changes a ship and you don't like it anymore? Refund it, get a different one. You don't like that one? Refund it, get a different one. You got it for, you got it for cheap. If you upgrade it, it costs what it costs now, not what you paid for it. So it counts as, you know, if you paid, if you paid $150 for your $200 ship and you want a $210 ship, it costs you $10 to upgrade it, not 60. And like, yeah, those numbers are big. But if you look at what, you know, your average mobile game is squeezing out of you, it's not that much. Speaking sure of isn't, mobile uh, games squeezing out of people, um, something that, that apparently happened this week and like, this is still kind of in the, the realm of rumor, but apparently like, Diablo Immortal had this thing at launch where if you refunded, they put your account into the negative and you couldn't do a bunch of activities until you trued up your account. Oh. It basically like t- took it out of Hawk. And like this is this is a thing that has been known for a while. So like you couldn't PvP if you had a negative gym store balance. Gross. So apparently there are people that bailed themselves out of this. And then for whatever reason this week, a huge chunk of those accounts got banned. Mm. And we don't like, nobody knows if it was like an automated action or what, but like, it seems to be a thing, but yeah, like, I mean, mobile games are, are awful at nickel and diming, but like to me, part of the benefit of playing when something is early access is getting a cheap retail copy. I, I think I remember paying $5 for Minecraft that's maybe the best five dollars I ever spent. I don't even play Minecraft, and I've never played that much Minecraft, and it's some of the best money I've ever spent. Anyway, I, I did get into an argument today about somebody who was ragging on Star Citizen. I'm like, well, wait a second, it, you don't have to spend fifteen hundred dollars for a ship. There, are pl- those are not designed for one person to fly. But yeah, it is sort of the joke that everyone uses. Mm-hmm. And it uh, it's sort of, it's it's interesting to me because it feels it feels very inverted where the um where the where the pain feels like it is for people. Like I mean Star Citizen gives people sticker shock. Yeah, Star Citizen gives people sticker shock. And a lot of and and I and you know it's like I get it. A lot of a lot of places a lot of people get sticker shock from you know various various things in, in the game in games but it's interesting to me that the sticker shock people look at the sticker shock and they say this game is uh you know this game is, is unfair whereas like the games that are actually unfair feel like that's feel like they're barely even talking about it i mean they're designed to make it feel like they're not unfair right yeah well they're designed yeah they're they're carefully designed to trick you and you and like by and large and i realize this is not universal but by and large the the gaming populace is reasonably good at noting when they're being tricked and like usually being pretty annoyed about it so it's somewhat interesting it's somewhat interesting slash surprising to me that that we're not that that people are like oh well i mean I don't know. It's for this game's fine. This game's not cheating me. That game is cheating you. You're just not aware of it. Yeah. I, I just, I mean, I assume we got here because we've now had a generation of folks who are used to the free to play model. And like, admittedly, there's a lot of value that you can eke out of those games for free. If you're willing to play a substandard experience. If only everybody could have been like Nintendo and used the term free to start. Yeah. But like the Nintendo free to play model was like spend five dollars. 
Well, the Nintendo Free to Play model looks a lot like those other models, except usually it cuts you off when you hit game price. Right. At which point they turn everything all the way up and you can't spend any more money. That, of course, cuts off your uh, your whales, as it were. So nobody else is doing that. Right. But I think that's maybe why I didn't mind their games as bad. It was like, there was eventually a point where I was like, oh, okay, sure. I don't know. Um, also in the realm of ARPGs that are a shockingly good value, um, I, I have been playing a lot of Path of Exile. I talked about it quite a bit last week. Um, but one of the things that I have been hunting for in that game is a bow character that felt comfortable to play. And I never quite found it in in the other leagues. Um, I didn't really love Explosive Arrow that much. <laughs> like, it was fine, but it, like, didn't feel great. Um, and, like, effectively, this is my fourth league. Um, Sent- like, I've played in a lot of more leagues than that. But Sentinel was the first league that I kind of sort of had an idea of what I was doing. And last league, I was trying to get a Toxic Rain build off the ground. And the problem that I ran into is the switch over to Toxic Rain didn't feel great. Like, usually that that ends up leveling as something else. And then there's a point where you switch over to Toxic Rain. And I'm not sure why... But it doesn't feel great at that point. So, like, I kind of struggled, and I tried a Trickster, and then I tried uh, the beginnings of a Pathfinder, and I essentially got to the same point of where I now have access to Toxic toxic Rain, but, like, this doesn't feel amazing. So what I did this time is I, I, I started Pathfinder, and instead of starting Toxic Rain, I stayed with Caustic Arrow as long as I could. Even to the point where in early maps, I was running Caustic Arrow as my self-cast and then Toxic Rain as my Ballista setup. And that felt great. Like, and if the there damage... There are some game characters with that setup. Yeah, Caustic Rain, I guess, requires a lot more gear investment to make it work right than Toxic Rain does. Um, and, and, and I really hit this point where... I was starting to notice the damage dropping off with Caustic Arrow. Um, And at that point, I swapped over to Toxic Rain as my self-cast and Toxic Rain as my Ballista. And at that point, for whatever reason, the gear was in the right state and it felt great. Like, at that point, like, that, with enough gear, Toxic Rain felt really good. Um... And, and basically, like, Toxic Rain is this ability that you don't actually cast like it's supposed to. Um, even when I say I'm self-casting it, what I mean is I have Mirage Arrow, Arrow <laughs> Archer in my, in my setup, and I am just hitting Toxic Rain every so often to make sure the Spectral Archer above my head is firing Toxic Arrow, or Toxic Rain. Um, but, like... It's really like relaxing to play in a way that I had not experienced with a bow build in Path of Exile to this point. Cause like you just kind of run around and make sure you're keeping up your 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 totems and make sure you're keeping up your uh Mirage Archer and stuff just melts so long as you kind of run around in circles. And I've done through T16 maps with it now and like it is way squishier than my righteous fire juggernaut, which yeah, is not but shocking, but like it's a kind of tanky. Killing everything on the screen does not mean you are tanky. Well, okay, so but also Pathfinder is essentially a a free mage blood. It, it is that, yes. So I just have to keep preemptively like that was the piece that I wasn't getting at first, is like realistically, it wants me to preemptively tap my healing flask every so often just to make sure I have a heal sitting there ticking waiting for me to take damage also like like all of the time I spent clearing like even T16s I didn't have one of my defensive layers set up so I didn't have a cast when damage taken molten shell set up yet and that improved it as well does that character have enough armor for molten shell to be good uh, it's running. Wait, no, uh, you're running a granite flask. Never mind. I'm running a granite flask, and I'm also running um, 
determination. And I have enough of a blend of armor ES pieces along with my armor ES pieces to make it kind of work. I have to say, I, I, I have played it, but I feel like I still don't understand Path of Exile. And boy, it sounds like you, when you describe this, it does sound like you kind of need a PhD in Path of Exile to play Path of Exile. I mean, I am only at this so, point after four or five seasons. So here's the thing. Path of Exile is a hideously complicated game. Like, overwhelmingly so. So, like, there is an amount of enjoyment you can do following a build guide and understanding that this makes a character that is maybe fun to play. This might might or might not work as what I want it to. Then there's modifying builds. Then there's seeing concepts and coming up a build. And I'm not there yet. Yeah, I'm not I'm not to step three. I am on step two now, where I will start down a path of a build, but I will veer off because I know I want it to behave a certain way. Like my my second Righteous Fire Juggernaut is wildly different than my first one was, but also it's considerably different than the Pox build that I kind of loosely followed because like I have certain preferences and the thing that I wish guides did better is call out. This is how you're going to get your damage. This is how you're going to get your survival. Like these are your defensive layers. These are the numbers you need to hit for this build to feel good because like they all have that like a armor based build until you hit 90% physical reduction is going to feel kind of weak. And then when you hit 90% physical reduction, it's just all of a sudden magically better. Like if you can get enough armor to hit 90%, life is grand. I would imagine you can can get, you can do okay with numbers less than that. You you need to have a number that matters. Right. Some people try going, this is an armor based build and they don't actually put and get any armor. Right. But like, I feel like all of these defensive layers have certain breakpoints that you want to hit. Like probably 80% is a good one for evasion. Cause like I'm below that and it definitely doesn't feel great yet, but if I can ever get to 80% evasion, yeah, that probably feels good. Especially well, path of exile it's evasion is a stronger defensive layer than basically any other game ever. It's still like, it's okay. Um, my saboteur last league was running evasion was running grace and determination. And that was great. But I feel like not any one of these is good enough. You need more than one defensive layer to make a a build feel good. So like on my Juggernaut, I have extremely high armor, overcapped elemental resistances and chaos resistance, and I have really high regen. And collectively, those make it feel tanky. On my Archer, I am headed towards, I'm already 100% Uh, spell suppression which means all spell damage is just dealing half damage and now i'm trying to get my evasion up to where i'm just not taking damage enough then when i do take damage it doesn't feel super bad because like my other my my flasks can kick in to to save me from that but like i i also kind of feel like the guides don't really explain how the build works very well I they mean, just give you there's a, tree. a lot of that, yes. They give you a tree, and they tell you what to pick at each level, but, like, given that your gear isn't easily templated, <laughs> I mean, like, okay, so sure, you showed some items in, in the build, but, like, I don't know how to get those items. Tell me what numbers I need to hit, and that would be something that's more realistic. So, like, I know, doesn't matter what character I'm playing, I need... At a minimum, 75% to all elemental resistances and 75% to chaos resistance. Like, that's just a thing I need to hit. Like, that's baked into every build now. Then, now I'm starting to understand, like, how to make the different armor types feel reasonable. But again, like, this has been a process. Like, I, I'm just now feeling like I have any grasp on how mechanics work. And I'm however many years into the game i think it is annoying a problem that this game is so unapproachable but at the same time all of these various interactions all of these systems are why i like it at the moment so there's yep. an incredible amount of tension there and i don't know what can be done about it. i mean right 
the one of the things that could be done, we've talked about at length on this show, is to allow for more experimentation. I mean, that's true, yes. And also to, like, actually try to teach players about, like, how to build a character to be successful. What? Like, your games should teach people how to play the games. What? Yeah, that's never going to happen here. <laughs> I hope it does. Like, it's they seriously need to make serious steps in that direction for PoE2. Well, there's enough of a conflict between what the players want and what the studio seems to want that I don't know that they would ever agree on, on what that even means. Like in what way do you mean that? The studio seems to want this game to be the most hardcore game ever. I I would think that the studio would want players to be able to uh, win against the content that they generate. Oh no, no, they don't. They very much clearly don't. (laughs) They wouldn't release things that are so grossly out of band and punishing if they actually wanted their players to win. I mean, like, I don't think most game studios release something with the idea that it's impossible. This isn't most game studios. I guess I, that's fair. I, I mean, definitely okay. feel so, so hostility from them at some times. To back up, they, there is some amount of, they want, they do want people to try things. They want people to fail a lot. Yeah. Okay. Do they do they know how uh, how much cost each failure should uh, incur? Not not well. Because like in Celeste, it's maybe five frames. That's a that's a reasonable cost for failure. Yeah. I mean, I I still feel like the prime example of this is you know I talked about this I think last week that the league challenge a race that is supposed to be happening. And normally when they do one of these races, it's over in a couple days, but yeah, the but race always run by like the same three people. Right. But like the race is supposed to be the Uber bosses in ruthless. And I was listening to a stream by Krikparian and no one has beat the Uber bosses ever since the release of ruthless. Oh, Let alone do it in a racing manner. Crypt likes Ruthless. He which loves is it. weird. He loves Ruthless, but he's like, I don't think this one's gonna <laughs> nobody's gonna <laughs> win this. Because it's not just Ruthless, but it's Ruthless solo self-found yeah, hardcore. Ruthless. Yeah. So like nobody's gonna win this at all. Like, no. I mean, of note, like the big difference between Ruthless and uh normal mode is Okay, so we, we talked about the extreme drop rate difference. So, like, items are just super hard to get. But also, you don't get any abilities off of the vendor. Oh, you so have you have to get all of your abilities to drop? All your you abilities to, to drop. Quests still give abilities. Yeah, so quests still give a handful of abilities. So it is commonplace Basically, for someone... the abilities offered to your class are all you're going to get. Right, yeah. So, like, it is, it is... But there's still a bunch of abilities... Like all the stuff that comes from library, most of the support abilities just don't exist off of a quest. Um, so you're going to have to get them to drop. I, mean, I think library quest gives you what? One free ability choice or something a like single that. Single free ability choice. Yes. So, so yeah, it's diffi- extremely difficult to assemble a build in Ruthless. Extremely difficult to get items in Ruthless. I don't think they properly thought out this how well this was going to go no no because yeah, like i've not i've not even gotten my four void stones ever like i might be able to do that this league because my righteous fire juggernaut is stronger than any character i've had but like i don't know i don't know if i'll be able to do that because it's real good at staying alive but it's not super great at killing things i suspect you'll be just fine at the uh elder shaper one and the Maybe one might be an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, I think I'm just going to die a couple times. I might get through it in six portals. <laughs> I just, I, I'm back to like, you obviously want people like, but that's the thing is they want people to optimize this game, right? Like if you're going to put that type of content, the only way people are going to find success is if they try and break everything in half and try and optimize it to the nth degree, right? 
So, like, that style of gameplay needs to be there, but, like, you need to teach players how to do that. Like, if you, if you want to do that, you need to be way more open about how your systems work. I mean... Or maybe they don't want that. I suspect what's I suspect what's far more likely is that they've gotten high on their own supply and listen to the players who want the most hardcore too much. Because it's a thing that game devs do do. That's why people still make games that are open PvP MMOs and just don't know. Like the idea that you would not do it that way is just an anathema. Like, of course you're gonna make it as hardcore as possible because that's what our players love. And it's a lot easier to cater to a group that you know than a group that you that you don't. Mm. Yeah. And so you end up with this very navel gazing, you know, circular this is what our players love, therefore this is what we do, versus like that's not actually the optimal thing to be doing. To be a little bit fair to Grinding Gear, they at least backed off of some things like that. They do. Like they, like, did, they did Nerf Crucible. They did finally change the Arch Nemesis system back to something that made sense. Right. But, was, but, but they fought with it for like three leagues? Two leagues, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, do any of their players love Ruthless Solo Self Foul? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Some people absolutely love it. Not well, the people who normally give commentary to them, though. But yeah. they, 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 for a certain group of people, it is exactly what they want. I mean, I, I understand that there's a small group of people that will enjoy that. And I admit I'm curious and would probably try it and then throw things. But, yes. you know. Well, I would never do it as a league. No. That would have to be a character that I'm planning on playing for years. Right. I would do a standard Ruthless character, but not, not a league journey. Like... I mean, like, I've gotten much faster at doing leagues. <laughs> I mean, because basically we're, what, two weeks in, and I've already largely solved the problem of my first character, and I'm working on a second character, and have a third character waiting in the wings. <laughs> like, that t- that helmet was too good not to make a, a <laughs> explosive summon Raging Spirits. But, like, I, I think Ash has the right of it, though, because, like, it's it, I, I am torn... Because the nonsense levels of complexity in this game are what keep me interested, but it's also the thing that makes it to where I can't, in good conscience, actually recommend this game. Well, that's the thing. Like, I love difficult stuff, and I like complex stuff, but, like, I want a game to... I I need a game to meet me halfway there. And, like, I've played a decent amount of this, and the game is mostly not interested in teaching me like what what works what doesn't or giving me the feedback i need to like try and muddle through myself yeah and and like the frustrating thing is is, like i'm pretty sure you've not actually made it to any of the stuff i actually find fun i'm not good enough or my character builds aren't and this is why I've been enjoying Last Epoch, because it has enough chewy, interesting things to mess around with, but also is really forgiving if I go, oh, this sucks, I want to switch my build, and I don't have to level another character over again from scratch. I think, like, Last Epoch is one of those games that, like, I enjoy right now, but I think there'll be a point at which I really love the game. And I, and I don't mean that I don't love it right now. It's just there's there's a lack of depth in the game that what I really enjoy is like all the weird game modes that Path of Exile has. And like if I'm in the mood to do heist, I go do heist. If I'm in the mood to do delve, I go do delve. If I'm in the mood to like run maps, I have a bunch of different ways to optimize running maps. And the monolith is cool, but the monolith right now in its current state is also kind of basic. Yeah. And the game needs some kind of chill activity that doesn't punish quite so harshly if you die. Right. Right. Because it feels real bad to do it like a, a monolith echo the second time just to clear it out of the way so you can get to something on the other side, knowing that you're not going to get any rewards from it. Yeah, it's not the best. I think that 
And I think that there's a certain amount of like, I, I like Path of Exile. It has some old school thinking that is not serving it and thinks that it's serving, that thinks it is serving it. Like it's very much built to be a better Diablo 2. And in some ways it hasn't really learned what parts of Diablo 2 maybe it should have shrugged off. Well, and the other thing is, like, the larger it gets, the more of its community wants the more chill League experience. This is this is true of games. Like, you, you, the larger your population grows, I mean, the larger your population grows in a game, the more people want to play that game as something they're doing for fun, not as their forever hobby. And if you don't support those people, they'll be like, this sucks. I mean, I kind of think it's evidenced by the fact that, like, if you look at the quote unquote meta charts, most of the players are following one of like five builds in any given league. Yeah. Like, it is a solved problem that someone has figured out for them, and all they have to do is follow the guide. And this used to be worse. Like, the last three leagues have like record build diversity where the top build is only 5% of everyone. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why I leveled another Righteous Fire Juggernaut is it is extremely functional and I can use it to fund other things I want to play, but also still enjoy it. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out a little bit what that looks like for me because Righteous Fire is not it. Right, Um, because that is too passive of a play style for you, I think. Yes, it is. Um, Seismic Trap was fun. They dumpstered that build this league, but whatever. Um. I've heard Fire Trap is really good, though. Fire Trap is quite good. I think what uh, Fire Fire Trap usually is Elementalist or Elementalist. Yeah, the dumb build that's going around now of exploding totems looks. I'm hilarious. not even going to do that. That relies on a Crucible Passive Tree. Exactly. Yes, it's really cool that there are builds that rely on Crucible Passive Tree, but they're not going to be around for next league. Yeah, like basically that involves you running up a bunch of base items, hoping to find one that has this one specific passive on it. I mean, I had an axe that had that one specific passive on it earlier. I mean, I guess you could have melted it to something else. I have yet to see a crucible passive tree that is actually good. Like I have a scepter right now that has a couple things that aren't awful. And I have a shield that has a couple things that aren't awful. I'm calling myself a winner. Some of those crucible trees are just universally bad. So Half-Life Alex doesn't require VR anymore. Yeah. So there is a, there is a uh, very solid mod that removes the need to use VR. If you want to play Half-Life Alex, Uh, it's been like working its way up in over the past probably year and change. And now it's basically fully functional. Um, You lose a lot. To be fair, but also, also it's good. Like you can, that that was a game that you could very easily get into a place where it's like, oh, I, I want to play this, but I don't want to shell out, you know, a few hundred dollars for uh or more for a VR headset to play it with. And so now it's like, yeah, you don't have to. You can you can try it without necessarily having to do that. Um, and it's it's fun. Like that's I I. I return to the Half-Life Alex is uh, easily the best argument for VR like that's been made. Um, but but if you want to try it just because like you're interested in the story, which is still pretty good, or you just want to see the incredible environments, like you could do that. And I think that's I think it's cool. It's something that that's been added or at least made possible. I may actually have to check that out then because like. <sighs> I'm I'm still just not sold on the concept of VR necessarily, nor do I want to arrange the amount of space it would require. Yeah, I don't blame you. So, but I but I did want to play Half Life, Alex. Like I thought that was, I mean, it looked like an interesting game. BattleTech Mercenaries Kickstarter. Yeah. So, uh, joining joining the August ranks of uh, Pebble and Frosthaven and Pebble. And uh, several 3D printers and Pebble uh, and I don't know the Binding of Isaac and also Pebble. Um, yes, there are three Pebble Kickstarters that all hit the top funded projects on Kickstarter. Uh, BattleTech Mercenaries actually, it's they've been running a Kickstarter that I haven't really 
I think I idly mentioned once, but has been running for the last, you know, I'm not even sure, a uh, month or so. I mean, 30 uh, days. <laughs> 30 days or so. And it's made seven and a half million dollars. Turns out people were into Battletech, yo. Yeah. I mean, to the surprise of, I think also the Battletech people, uh, Battletech is a, a property that, a game that hasn't necessarily significantly changed in 40 years, uh, is doing great on Kickstarter. And I don't know, that's, that's really cool to me to, to see it all kind of coming together and watching them, watching them succeed. Uh, they're clearly good caretakers of the, um, of the IP. I mean, they went through a lot of legal trouble to get here, so I sure hope so. Yep. Yeah, they've gone through, they've got through some pain to, to get there, but, but they have. And, you know, they're, they're making new minis. They've made a like lighter, more accessible version of the game, uh, which I think is a good thing to have. <laughs> um, they've, they're just, I mean, they're just delivering on, Hey, here's everything that you need and or want for your, uh, for your battle tech experience. I'm very excited for this, uh, co-op versus AI thing. Oh yeah. They're, and and that's the other thing is they're kind of they're they're continuing to advance the uh just the stuff that the game is doing in a really cool way in my opinion um like they're making they're making a single player or you know expre- expressly co-op version of a minis game which is straight up hey uh you want to play you know we've seen this with Kingdom Death uh and Kingdom Death was great and so they're like yeah we can make you can make a you can make what's this called? Uh, you know, card decks that explain how you how you actually play. You know, what do, what do the NPCs all do? Uh, you know, what do what do the um, you know how does how does it decide what to do each turn? I always find that pretty cool. It's neat. It's neat to see it all kind of come together. Yeah, I'm especially, I think that stuff is sweet because I would like to be able to do, like, I don't, some tactical minis games are fun, but, like, the stuff that I find fun about doing, like, Mech Warrior is, hey, I'm in a mercenary crew and I have to make sure that, like, I repair my mechs and I'm, like, trying to find the right salvage to, like, tune my mech up and all of that stuff if you turned those rules on in a competitive fashion would just lead to the most snowball-y game imaginable. Like you, you lose once and suddenly you are both behind on rewards and your mechs are damaged and you don't have the resources to repair them. Yeah. So you're just always behind. Yeah. And it works in a game like, so like Necromunda does this and it broadly works in Necromunda because First, there's a certain amount of randomness inherent in playing Necromunda. Just <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and players understand it's going to be a little janky going into the game. Yeah, and that's the other part is it it knows it knows that it's jank. It's at some level it's sort of reveling in being kind of jank, and that's that's part of that's part of the fun. But you also have to be there. You 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 have to be there for that kind of fun. Does but like presumably also it doesn't like in Necromunda like usually you start with the same force or you aren't going in completely mismatched like there are army building rules that you're still following each time you play right yeah but like the, a Necromunda campaign you're starting from the same start point but uh, you sure don't necessarily end up staying at the same start point oh, or the weird. same balance point because like. You win, you get money. You can spend that money for more dudes or more equipment or more whatever. You know, it's a it's a success begets success sort of thing. Yeah, I would be. I would think that would be extremely awkward, like because especially if you start winning a couple in a row and the skill the 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 power differential becomes that much. Yeah. Well, I mean, and and that's why Necromunda has explicit. You should have somebody, you should have a DM for your campaign, and your DM should feel completely empowered to see a player that's snowballing and punch them in the face. 
or take a player who's losing and give them a bunch of, of free stuff to help catch up. Like it's built into, I mean, it's built into their actual rule books and, I mean, and a, you know, being a, really janky is also built into their actual rule books. Yeah. So people argue whether or not their rule books are actually, there are things there. I would say Necromunda probably does a better of balancing out or job balancing out than like Mordheim did. <laughs> yeah. And you know, there's, there's a certain amount of, yes, this is a broadly competitive game, but you're not really playing it to win. You know, the, the widely, the widely held view among Necromunda players is that like, yeah, if you want to break this game, you can, and then you and everyone else are going to have a bad time. And I think that's a, I think that's fine. Like I'm not, I think that it's, I think that it can be interesting to, I think it it can be interesting to have a game that you're playing quote unquote against your friends, but it's really more about the experience than it is declaring a winner. Um, And Battletech does have a, has, have a, have a almost terrifyingly detailed campaign system. Um, But it has a lot of the same kind of inbuilt controls. And also it's in some ways it's a game from the eighties and it's like, yeah, so you're going to snowball if you keep winning. That sucks. Doesn't it? We don't care. Like that's the experience. Say, when I was experiencing this at pandemonium, when I was watching people, it was less that and more of they had a DM and a group of players like D and D or something. Yeah. It was more like how they were handling battle tech as a tabletop game as, as how the campaign system works. Yeah, no. And that would make, a lot more sense to me. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, it's definitely an interesting take where it's like, yeah, this is, you know, D and D is a tactical miniatures game. You just don't play it with miniatures. It's a, I mean, but it's a tactical miniatures game that you're playing uh, with a bunch of friends against a DM. Like, there's no reason, and you can do very, you know, versions of D of D and D or variants of D and D where you aren't a hundred percent on the level with your party and those work but yeah it's it's an interesting thing to see and um i also just think it, like mechs are fun and it's i'm interested in it's a it's like a i'm interested in playing playing battletech the miniatures game partly because it's like it's a bunch of things that both kodra and ash have mentioned wanting in a miniatures game um but also it's just like mechs are cool i'm into it so I got to admit, when I saw the last or the next topic on the list, um, I kind of expected it to have been something that Grace put on there. Gunfire Reborn. It was not me, but I do love that game. It wasn't me either, even though I was the impetus to play it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday, whatever, no, whatever, whatever, whenever we played it. I don't know what got you playing it, but we Stolaris was crashing it. too much. You what? Yeah, Stolaris, Stolaris was, was crashing, crashing too much. Ah, um... Man, I didn't like that game when it came out, when I first played it in early access years ago. I was going to say, uh, I looked at my last played date was in 2021. That game's fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I played it last year, it was really fun. While there is only one character choice they start you with still, um, well, one, you can DLC your way out of that if you really want to. But also, there's enough variety in weapons that just matters less than I expected. Like... The amount of weapons you get access to very quickly is way more than I remember. And some of them are weird and interesting. Like this one that makes uh, bolt-style like electric shields that you can just shoot through for bonus damage. Or the weird, these needles follow your cursor around the screen. That thing is weird. That thing is so awesome. I love it to death. I like the other throwing daggers where you can like mark people with alt fire and then just sort of throw things at them. I mean, also good. I'm not going not gonna to lie. Also good. I had a lot of fun with the rocket because <laughs> rocket launchers are fun. Rocket launchers are always fun. And this game does give you a little more ammo to play with than our Destiny usually used to. Well, and also you can get uh, roguelike builds that let you turn all of your ammo into rocket ammo, which I picked up. I, I just remember playing some lizard that belts fire or something. I like that I could get a couple of... Um, I like that I could get a couple of um different characters um i don't always like i didn't really love the like the starter character and that's a that's a thing that i've had it's a problem that i have with a lot of similar games where i'm like they give me one character to choose from and i don't like that character and so i'm just like 
my motivation to play the game to unlock further characters, which I know is what I'm supposed to want to do, but I just don't because I'm like, Ugh, I don't actually want. I don't. I didn't. I don't enjoy this enough. I'm not hooked enough with the main character to actually want to play the other characters. Yeah, that's kind of the risk of rain problem. It was absolutely a risk of rain problem for me. Like I was fine with the first character in Risk of Rain, but like I feel like the order in which I unlocked additional characters is not the order in which I would have wanted to play them. Risk of Rain, the first one anyway, is an interesting example because they start you with arguably the best character in the game. But yeah, it's he's boring. Just not that much fun to play a lot of the time. And yeah, like there's also the boring but effective problem. But that's usually a that's usually a different thing. That's like it tends to be what roguelikes want to give you for their, their first character, though. It so is. they tend to overlap a lot. It does. And it does, and it bugs me. Um, but on the other hand, it's like, it's one of those things that's like, yep, I shelled out, I don't even know, a couple bucks. It's like five bucks. <laughs> five bucks or whatever for a different character. And it's like, instantly, I like this game more. Cool. Into it. I didn't mind mind the first character. The- I like the first. I, I like. I think the stasis power is rather strong. I think that character's grenade is quite good. I never really understood the grenade, but the stasis power is what I got all my upgrades in, and it was good. Um, uh, the grenade is starts off being a sort of ground based dot, which is okay. And some of the rogue like things just make it crazy. Like characters affected by this deal forty percent less damage and take thirty percent more. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The the the. It says after you beat it that the last bosses, all of his attacks can be dodged, which makes me think there must be uh, some serious iframes going on because I was trying to like dodge to get out of the way and that wasn't good enough. You have to dodge real soon, like as it's, as he's winding up. Oh, to like get out the way? Yeah, it's targeted when the attack starts, not when the attack finishes. Not when the attack launches. Ah, oh, got it. But yeah, first boss, a little rough solo. Not that much less rough in a group, <laughs> but that tends to be my experience in these types of games before I uh, have a good understanding of all of the things. Yeah, I mean, I got that. I, I got that the little floaty knife thing and learned how to use it and then immediately just obliterated that boss. It was a whole time. I always just really liked the sense of power progression in that game. Like it just it felt relatively fair and yeah some of the the weapons and things that you unlock are just the different ways to upgrade just felt really good and i like the way that it kind of introduces weapons onesies twosies at a time and then from that point on you start seeing them more often but like it kind of rations the number you get at first so you can have a chance to like try them out and get used to them before adding new weapons into the mix yeah, and the weapon unlocked by beating the first boss is one of my favorite weapon archetypes ever that you never ever see uh the rapid fire shotgun generally i only associate these with like warframe yeah see i've always liked that kind of weapon the combat shotgun but they're so rare because yep. the doom shotgun has infected everyone's mind which to be fair not the worst thing in the world i really loved the combat shotgun from uh the original deus ex which was like this rat like round barreled thing that would yep. had fully automatic f- fire on it yeah i want to say soldier of fortune i don't remember if it was one or two also had something like that that i u- used to play with all the time I mean, the the great era of quake three games had several of them <laughs> so what about stellaris co-op because it sounds like that's that's the game that made you move over to Got to fire Reborn. Yeah, I mean, and that would until make we it... started getting desynced all the time, that was really fun. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, and that might make you think, wow, this must be a really terrible experience. I mean, the experience was not great because we kept getting desynced and like it was buggy because it was a beta, but um, just doing co op Stellaris was a lot of fun. And their method of co op is well, you have one empire and you have two people controlling it. And at first, you might be like, well, doesn't that mean like every player has half as much to do in Stellaris? But the thing with Stellaris is you're desperately trying to get an AI to take over a large chunks of it about like a third of the way into the game. So yeah, I 
honestly, like once we got past that beginning part where it's like, okay, we're just like doing some initial work and things are a little bit slow, there was plenty of game to be played by both of us. Well, that's kind of always the 4X thing is, though, because like there's always way more to do than you have focus. Yes. I was going to go with mental capacity, but yeah. They, they use the term cognitive load. And like one of the, one of the specific things is like people were finding like people who want to play competitive Stellaris found it not very fun because the cognitive load of doing competitive Stellaris was too much for one person. And so this is the idea of like, you can have team versus team in that game. I don't think I want to play competitive Stellaris for a whole host of reasons. Uh, yeah. Start starting with like that whole thing about I I would prefer a game that runs that long to not be just incredibly snowbally and Stellaris is about as snowbally as it gets. But it it was fun. I think it's a good idea to play something that is planning on becoming the crisis. <laughs> One way or another, because you kind of want to make sure you're always, you always have game actions to be taking for multiple people. And, and uh, like frustratingly, pacifist kind of hits a point where they don't have a ton of game actions to be taking. But yeah, I thought it was fun. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to getting out of beta and then figuring out this desync issue. Ah, uh, classic. Network code is hard, yo. Ne- network code is hard. It gets harder when you add in random numbers. Yeah. We kept desyncing on our random number generator, which is never a good sign. So I know we talked a little bit about this last week, but since then, I think, Kodra, you've had a chance to see the Super Mario Brothers movie. I saw the Super Mario Brothers movie, yes. I enjoyed it very much. I got to see it with my child, which is the right way of seeing that movie. Like, it's just really fun watching a kid enjoy that movie. Um, But I had a great time with it, too. I had an absolute blast. Lots of cute callbacks and whatnot. This is not going to be a spoiler discussion. Uh, I'm willing to do that at a later date, because I did think there was at least one thing interesting in there to talk about. But I also saw the Dungeons and Dragons movie last night, and there's been a lot of ink getting spilled on the internet about, like, the Dungeons and Dragons versus the Mario movie. And I've now seen both of them, and it's like, these are fundamentally two different products aimed at two different people. Like, and... Gasp. (laughs) Like... You're you're looking. There are a lot of people who are upset that the Mario movie is seeing a ton of a ton of commercial success, despite perhaps being a little bit thinner plotted than the very fun and very much more intricately plotted Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm like, yeah, but like, who's going? Who's going to be spending the money on seeing these movies? In a lot of cases, it's probably going to be parents, and kids' movies have always been a lot more financially successful at the box office. The most financially successful movie of 2020 was Sonic the Hedgehog. I feel like that year gets a bit of a... (laughs) Wait. I remember that year. It's still happening. Yeah. There was a big thing that whether Detective Pikachu or Sonic the Hedgehog was going to make more money. Yeah, it wasn't particularly close. I'm really surprised because Detective Pikachu was a really good movie. Detective Pikachu was a really good movie. Yeah. I, I still have yet to see Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> I, me either. Man, now there's a thesis of, like, Justice Smith getting pitched against the, the like, old 80s console war tent poles. Because he was also in Detective Pikachu. But yeah. If you have kids, I'd recommend taking them to see the Mario movie. If you don't have kids and are looking for, like, maybe a little bit less of a kiddie movie, Dungeons and Dragons Honor Amongst Thieves, really good. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing the D&D movie. I definitely watched the Super Mario Brothers movie, 
And it was fine, but I don't have kids, and I have a reasonable amount of nostalgia, and that made it fun, but not great. It was enjoyable, but I'm really looking forward to watching the D&D movie. I mean, with the D&D movie, anywhere they go is up. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that franchise... I mean, you can also say that for the Mario movie. Yeah, I mean, like, in both cases... They couldn't do worse. It was mathematically impossible for them to do worse. <laughs> so I feel like that franchise at some point released like an interactive DVD choose your own adventure kind of experience that was actually entertaining. I do not remember this. So like, if this exists, I need to find it, find out about it. I I I feel like this is a thing that I owned and lent to a friend that we played D&D with and never saw again. <laughs> but I remember it being like way more entertaining than the actual like theatrical release. I uh, I will say though for the D&D movie, uh I maybe I've only seen him in certain roles, but I did not know Chris Pine was as good at being an actor as he is chris pine was excellent in this movie i mean i'm the heretic that liked his star trek movies i liked his star trek movies i thought well so i only saw a few of them and i think that maybe i I think i actually only saw the first one and he was a very smarmy kirk and he was kind of all smarm in that movie is what i remember so I don't know. I didn't see either of the other two movies. I mean, to be fair, original series Kirk is kind of a jackass, too. I, I mean, this is totally reasonable. I, I'm just saying, like, I think maybe Chris Chris Pine got more to work with in this role, and it really does a really good job with it. I, I mean, I thought he was fine, but mostly boring in Wonder Woman. That wasn't much of a character. Yeah, like that's the thing is like I'm wondering if this is I just haven't seen him in enough movies and I was judging too harshly. Yeah, I look forward to seeing this as well. Any uh, last minute topics? Doesn't sound like it. Okay. Well, hopefully you enjoyed the show and we will see you again next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you.